Hi, everybody. Welcome back to English 221. This is for our class for Wednesday, the 20th of April. And as you know, we did not have class on Monday because it was Patriot's Day. So where we left off last week is I was having you watch a production of Macbeth from the Royal Shakespeare Company, a very esteemed production company. And that, by the way, will be the attendance question is what you thought about that particular performance. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the elements of the plot that I wanted us to focus on over the next couple of classes. And notice how the play begins with the very famous line, fair is foul and foul is fair. Nothing is as it seems, and there's lots of equivocation and a lot of paradox that we see throughout the drama. Notice that we have three witches. Three is an important number. In this particular play, we get three prophecies, for instance. And three has lots of Christian symbolism associated with it. The idea of the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And of course, with the witches, what we have is a kind of unholy Trinity. And at the time of the Renaissance, witches really would have been seen as a possibility, much like fairies would have been seen as a possibility as well. Though the play oftentimes is read as Macbeth himself hallucinating many of the elements that occur within the drama. But the witches at the beginning appear both to Macbeth and Banquo, which would suggest that the witches really are real entities. And remember that Macbeth has established himself as a brave warrior by defeating a traitor, the Thane of Cawdor. This is ironic because Macbeth himself is going to become a traitor. And think about the idea of the definition of tragic hero, about a great man above and beyond the ordinary. And perhaps Macbeth has distinguished himself as great above and beyond the ordinary because he has defeated the Thane of Cordo. And of course, the witches provide prophecies for both Bank. Uh, for both Banquo and Macbeth. And the idea behind a prophecy leads to questions of fate and free will. Is a prophecy merely foretelling the future or is a prophecy influencing the future? It's one of the questions that is also examined in Oedipus the King, the Greek drama that helped to establish the Aristotelian idea of tragedy and tragic characters. And of course, Banquo is suspicious initially. One should be suspicious of witches because of the evil that usually is associated with them. Macbeth is not. And notice how quickly Macbeth is persuaded to take action, which suggests that perhaps Macbeth had already been contemplating the idea of usurping the kingdom. We already know through Richard II that the king would be seen as God anointed. So the idea of usurping a king would be comparable to usurping God. So the consequences are significant. And this play really is more about the consequences than about the deed. And I had suggested that I believe that one of the reasons, and others as well, believe that it's so important that this play be short is that it illustrates how quickly the descent occurs once one engages in evil actions. So, of course, Macbeth writes a letter to Lady Macbeth, and one of the questions I had asked you to consider is, could Lady Macbeth be seen as an outside force, which is one of the elements associated with tragic hero? And could the witches themselves be seen as outside forces? And certainly we can talk about how both the witches and Lady Macbeth urge Macbeth on. That said, ultimately, Macbeth decides to take action on his own. And do note that Macbeth probably is quite familiar with his lady Macbeth, uh, dearest partner in greatness. So this is a very different kind of relationship than what we saw with Richard when women basically were not involved in the political functionings of the day. But one suspects that Macbeth would have anticipated exactly how Lady Macbeth responds, which is urging Macbeth on, perhaps, as I suggested in some of your attendance question responses. This is exactly what Macbeth wanted, so that he wouldn't necessarily have to take complete blame for his actions. That said, Lady Macbeth, as strong as she is, has perhaps one of the most famous speeches in, in Shakespeare when she says, unsex me here. And the idea is that she needs to lose any kind of feminine quality or motherly quality associated with female so that she can engage in murder and be strong. King Duncan 
is completely oblivious to the dangers that await him. He arrives at the castle and says that this castle hath a pleasant seat. And we'll talk a little bit more about quotation next class. And never once realizing that he's walking into a trap. And we notice Macbeth in his vacillation until Lady Macbeth insults his manhood. And of course, as a as a warrior, remember he defeated the Thane of Cawdor. That's going to um, be a particularly vulnerable area for him. And in fact, this idea of manhood is something that we will be revisiting again when we talk about Othello. And Othello believes that his manhood is being attacked with the possibility of his wife being unfaithful. Now, I, I suggested earlier that there are two ways to read this play, certainly as an examination of the supernatural, but also an examination of the psychological, that Macbeth is hallucinating and oftentimes projecting. For instance, the very famous speech, is this a dagger I see before me? That could be a literal supernatural entity that is enticing him, but it can also be a figment of his imagination. And I oftentimes say that Shakespeare was perhaps the first psychologist, even though, or one of the first psychologists, even though Freud oftentimes gets credit for that, um, because Lady Macbeth's forever washing her hands um, out, out damn spot is a wonderful illustration of obsessive compulsive disorder before it was even labeled obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth hatched this plan that they are going to be committing murder. And then Lady Macbeth says that she couldn't do it because King Duncan resembled her father. So this could either be an illustration of weakness on her part, despite the fact that she asked the spirits to unsex her, or... It could also be very clever manipulation and that she doesn't want to be responsible for the deed. In other words, she wants Macbeth to be responsible so that she doesn't have the guilt or the consequences. But of course, this entire play is about guilt and consequences. So Macbeth becomes a killer. And as the play progresses, he becomes, and I remember this very clearly from a quote from one of my own professors in college about Shakespeare and specifically Macbeth, he becomes a killing machine where basically it snowballs into one killing after another after another until we can't really keep track of the bodies. Now, one of the things we know that Shakespeare likes to do is, is oftentimes to show us uh, a lower level character who illustrates a good amount of um, reason and a good amount of rationality. And this is something that we see in the drunken porter scene, act two, scene three. Certainly it provides some comedic relief in the sense that this is such a dark play that there really is very little um, um, in the way of, of any kind of um, 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 letting up of the anxiety and the, and the, the horrors um, of murder and the consequences of evil. But the drunken porter talks a little bit about drunkenness. And this was something that we saw a little bit with Dogberry as well when we talked about uh, Much Ado About Nothing. And Shakespeare oftentimes talks about drunkenness and uses that as a symbol or a metaphor for the idea of not having reason or rationality. And certainly Macbeth at this particular point in time has become drunk with power, intoxicated with it. And again, we'll review some of these very famous speeches next to class. Um, Lady Macbeth faints at a very pivotal point when there are accusations flying about the murder that has occurred with not only uh, Duncan, but with his, his serving men. And I think that this could easily be seen as a sign of weakness, but it could also be seen as a sign of incredible cleverness and that she's trying to take attention away from Macbeth because ultimately she understands that he could easily crack under pressure. A lot of this will be dependent on the actor and the director interpretation. Um, each production ultimately will give us a different sense and King Duncan's sons, they flee because they're afraid that they will be next. But, of course, that makes them seem guilty, Malcolm and Donald Bain, which perfectly works into Macbeth's plan, at least into the short term. 
And then as the drama continues, it talks a little bit about how nature itself is in discord. It's something that we talked about as well with um, Gaunt on his deathbed speech where he was talking about how um, England has basically been cannibalized and is cannibalizing itself. And nature itself is in discord because the political realm is in discord because the evil is basically cannibalizing and eating up the kingdom. And then, as I had indicated, Macbeth becomes a killer where basically there is no rhyme or reason, um, to use another Shakespeare phrase, um, for his actions. Initially, we could say that he perhaps might have motivation for killing Duncan, though he's never told that he needs to take action to make the prophecy come true. Again, notice the parallels with Oedipus the king. Oedipus the king is given a prophecy and he decides on his own to take action. And the irony is that his actions actually lead to the prophecy. Um, never do the witches say that Macbeth has to do anything for any of these prophecies to occur, but Macbeth takes it upon himself to, um, to believe, and again, with Lady Macbeth's urging that action needs to be taken. And of course, Banquo's suspicions increase over the course of the play. Um, at this point, Macbeth is so, um, he's, he's so insecure and, and he's so paranoid that he commissions murders for Banquo as well. The idea that it isn't enough for Macbeth to be able to have the throne, but the idea that Banquo's heirs will have the throne, it eats at him. Even though... Macbeth doesn't have any heirs, which is perhaps one of the most famous literary questions that's ever been asked. How many children does Lady Macbeth have? With one of her famous speeches when she talks about that she'll bash in the brains of a suckling babe. And that literary question of how many children does Lady Macbeth have is the equivalent of saying something like how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. In other words, there can never be an answer to that. But the idea that Macbeth has become so intoxicated by power that not only must he have power for himself, but no one and no one's heirs could ever have power either. Um, and then at, at this particular point, when Macbeth uh, commissions the murders for Banquo, Banquo's son, Fleance, escapes the murderers. Um, and Banquo's ghost at this particular point haunts Macbeth. And again, you could say that's a literal um, ghost, or we could say that that is a, a hallucination, a personification of Macbeth's guilty conscience. And then the probably one of the major shifts in the play is at this point, Macbeth decides to seek out the witches. Notice that at the beginning of the play, the witches seek out Macbeth. So perhaps we can say that he isn't completely responsible or culpable at the beginning of the play because they're the ones who plant the prophecies. However, once Macbeth decides to seek out the witches, he basically is seeking out evil. And he's given, once again, three prophecies and the idea of three is so pivotal in this play. One of them being beware Macduff, which means that as far as Macbeth is concerned, that he needs to have Macduff and Macduff's family killed. Again, by this particular point in the play, it's Macbeth has become drunk with, um, with, with paranoia and, um, and is just killing, um, relentlessly. Macduff goes to England to try to test Malcolm's loyalty. Um, and the murderers, instead of being able to kill Macduff, they kill Macduff's family. Um, this is where we afterwards get that very famous scene, Lady Macbeth, the out damned spot scene that I suggested is very much an indicator of obsessive compulsive disorder. And it also is quite interesting because Mac Lady Macbeth starts off as quite strong at the beginning of the play. But by the ending of the play, she basically collapses under the, the guilt of the her evil deeds and eventually commit suicide and in, in many ways we could say that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth as I suggested in some of your attendance questions they switch places that Macbeth becomes increasingly bestial and um, with the loss of humanity as Lady Macbeth um, basically starts that way but begins to crumble under the um, anxieties and the pressures of it so that she's much weaker I don't know if you noticed this, but Macbeth is consulting someone, and the name is spelled S-E-Y-T-O-N. And if you were to pronounce this out loud, Satan, 
then you would see that this is a play on Satan, S-A-T-A-N, the idea that Macbeth now is seeking out evil. Lady Macbeth, as I had indicated, commits suicide. This is something that also is very similar to Oedipus the King, where Oedipus's uh, mother slash wife, when she realizes that she has married her son and has had children with him, she commits suicide because she does not want to deal with the consequences. Um, Macduff is not of woman born, which is one of the prophecies that Macbeth is given. The witches tell the literal truth, but the idea of the literal truth is that it oftentimes can be misleading. It almost reminds me of a Twilight Zone episode and that it is true that there is no such thing as someone who is not of woman born. However, Macduff was born unnaturally through a cesarean section. And note the themes of what's natural and unnatural and how important those are in terms of the play. And of course, one of Macbeth's prophecies is that, that basically Burnham Hills will rise against him. and Or Burnham Wood will rise against him. And of course, a forest can't come alive. However, soldiers can be camouflaged as a forest and they can attack Macbeth and kill him, which is exactly what happens. So again, the uh, witches give the literal truth, but that is a misleading truth. And then finally, King Duncan's son, Malcolm, becomes king. And of course, I had indicated that this play would have been written for the reign of King James, and King James was very fond of Scottish King James. So it's not a surprise that we get a Scottish play so that King James could celebrate his heritage, but also the idea that King James was fond of shorter plays. And also King James was very interested in elements of the supernatural. And all of these are embedded within the drama, which I had indicated comes with a good amount of superstition associated with it, where there's a, a long tradition of terrible events occurring um, during opening nights of Macbeth or if an actor were to ever utter the name Macbeth on stage. And I, I know that I myself, several years ago, actually probably more than that, time flies, I was preparing for my class for Macbeth and I was going through my notes um, and it turns out that I was stung by a wasp in my office. This was the first time I'd ever been stung by a wasp. Um, it was quite painful and there was quite a bit of swelling. I'm, I'm happy to say I was not allergic, but it did strike me as that of all of the things that could have happened to me um, in terms of being stung by a wasp, that that occurred to me when I was preparing for, well, Macbeth the M play or the cursed play or the Scottish play as it's known. So do with that as you will. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was about the Royal Shakespeare Company's um, performance. And one of the very famous speeches by Macbeth is tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And the idea of the hopelessness and the helplessness that Macbeth has at the end. And the actor who played Macbeth in the performance that we saw from the Royal Shakespeare Company, Ian McClellan, has um, some reflections on that particular speech and his particular performance. It's approximately 15 minutes or so, but I, I thought it would be very useful for you to see um, how an actor goes about their craft. Um, and Ian McClellan in particular, Shakespearean trained, obviously, um, is, is very meticulous about um, motivation and how to go about performing a particular role. So I wanted you to see that. And then for today's attendance question, and then of course, next class, what we'll do is we'll talk about some specific quotation with Macbeth. Today's attendance question, and that will be due on a Friday. And that question is, do you like or dislike the Royal Shakespeare Company's 1976 performance of Macbeth? Or did you like or dislike the Royal Shakespeare's Company's 1976 performance of Macbeth and why? So I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. And next class, we will continue by talking about specific quotation in Macbeth. Take care. Bye-bye.